everybody. Welcome to Odd and Untold, the podcast where we talk about all things strange and spooky. And this week, we're taking a trip across the pond. We're going to the British Isles. We're going to talk about some Bigfoot reports and legends over there uh, in England and Ireland, Scotland, Wales, uh, the whole British Isles. Uh, People don't really associate Bigfoot with anywhere other than North America, even though there are hairy humanoids seen uh, in Europe, in Asia, China, Russia, uh, of course, India, Nepal, with the Yeti, the Abominable Snowman. Um, a few weeks ago, Scott and I had done a show regarding all the different types of Bigfoot, and we talked about, you know, the, the paddy sort of Bigfoot from the Pacific Northwest in Canada. We've talked about the the swamp apes and the, the skunk apes and the swamp monsters of uh, the southern United States and how these creatures are all different. And we, we kind of touched on the Yeti. Uh, and then John and I had done an episode on the movie, The Abominable Snowman, where we talked a little bit about Yeti. Uh, but this week I did want to talk about uh, Bigfoot in the British Isles. Uh, and this has come about mainly because uh, I've started watching the show Outlander uh, with my girlfriend, the lovely Rebecca. And it's it's a cool show. It's, it's the show about this woman who gets uh, pushed back in time. She time travels, basically, uh, thrown back in time to Scotland in the like mid 1700s so uh there's a lot of talk of scotland and and uh, craig nadun and, and and i'm sorry my scottish accent isn't so great um it is pretty great though um but it's not but all these names started reminding me of other things and uh outlander's a great show uh you, sh- you should give it a watch i mean it's a little rough in places just with the violence um, but great acting. Uh, my favorite is Graham McTavish and, uh, he's really good and there's no bias here. I don't like him just because he's a bald, all man with a silver beard. Anyway, great show, but the, the, the names of the show, Craig Nadun and, and places like that reminded me of a cryptid from Scotland that I'd read about when I was a child uh the big gray man of ben macdu so i'm going to talk a little bit about that and then we're going to get into some other bigfoot type creatures uh in ireland in wales in britain and then i'm going to read some mostly very short accounts from the british isles all over the british isles and um it's not the bfro they mainly stick to the united states and canada but i will be reading some accounts of bigfoot in the british isles so let's get to that so as I said, the, fir- the first myth I want to talk about is called the Big Gray Man, and in, in Gaelic it is Amphir Liath Mor. Again, my Scottish is, is pretty bad, but basically the Big Gray Man of Ben Makdu. Uh, so I'll read a little bit of this. Uh, Amphir Liath Mor, otherwise known as the Big Gray Man of Ben Makdu, is the name of the creature haunting the summit of Ben Makdu, the highest peak of the Cairngorms mountain range, and second only to Ben Nevis in the entirety of the British Isles. The Big Grey Man is alleged to be 10 feet tall and extremely thin with long limbs and dark hair. The creature seems eerily similar to the Yeti, or at least the myths around both creatures bear an uncanny resemblance. Most often, the creature is barely sighted at all. In fact, most accounts of the Big Grey Man report only auditory evidence. Hikers hear the crunching of leaves and footsteps coming up behind them, Sometimes, if they are lucky, hikers may even come across unusually shaped or large footprints, convincing them that they are, in fact, on the path of the big gray man. The actual creature, however, remains elusive. So right away, we have these parallels with Bigfoot or the Yeti. Uh, You know, footprints, uh, not really seen too much, but auditory evidence, uh, feet crunching. and, And I've talked about this in previous episodes where people will hear themselves being paralleled they'll hear every time they take a step it sounds like something else is taking a step along with them and it's not quite an echo because you kind of know what your movements are and what should be coming back to you if it is an echo and if it's a little bit off that can be a little off-putting so it it sounds like something is echo you know um, paralleling you this echo is a little bit off so it sounds almost like something's moving with you and when you stop then the footsteps stop you know a couple of seconds later so um, but they are seeing large footprints here as well. And uh, I'm going to switch over to the Wikipedia article because they have some accounts in there. 
Um, but a lot of the information here uh, is the same. Uh, but, you know, here it does say tangible evidence of his existence is limited to a few photographs of unusual footprints. So the majority relies on the credibility of eyewitness encounters. And isn't that kind of true with most of these things? We don't have a lot of photographs of any of these cryptids. I mean, Patterson-Gimlin film is pretty much the standard bearer. And anything outside of that doesn't always necessarily hold up to scrutiny. But they have these uh, footprints. Um, and in the Wikipedia article, they have a summit, a picture of the summit of Ben Maktiu. Uh, but I will start talking about some of the sightings of this creature. Uh, so in 1925, J. Norman Colley gave the first recorded account of a gray man encounter. A noted hiker, professor, and member of the Royal Geographical Society, Colley recounted a terrifying experience he had as he hiked alone near the summit of Ben Maktiu years earlier in 1891. So these reports go back pretty far. This is, you know, pre-internet and <laughs> pre-abominable snowman, Yeti sort of uh, Patterson-Gimlin footage making its way around the world. Uh, so Mr. Colley says, I was returning from the cairn on the summit in a mist when I began to think I heard something else than merely the noise of my own footsteps. Every few steps I took, I heard a crunch and then another crunch as if someone was walking after me, but taking steps three or four times the length of my own. I said to myself, this is all nonsense. I listened and heard it again, but could see nothing in the mist. As I walked on and the eerie crunch crunch sounded behind me, I was seized with terror and took to my heels, staggering blindly among the boulders for four or five miles, nearly down, and I'm going to butcher this, Rothermerkus Forest. Whatever you make of it, I do not know, but there's something very queer about the top of Ben Macdu, and I will not go back there again. So, again, you have this somewhat paralleling story the footsteps and this fear sort of overcomes him and these days a popular explanation for it is infrasound that these creatures create a sound uh that can frighten us that can stun us that can paralyze us uh there's also mind speak people will say that they you know hear things in their head but also if you think you're being followed by something very large that's just going to spook you anyway you don't need um infrasound to do that. So let me continue here. Uh, Kali's account was reported in the local press, which started a debate between skeptics and believers within the community. Other climbers came forward with their own encounters, which they had previously been afraid to share. So common theme with these sorts of things. One climber, Hugh D. Welsh, said that he hiked to the summit with his brother in 1904, where throughout the day and night, they heard slurring footsteps as if someone was walking through water saturated gravel. Both felt frequently conscious of something near us, an eerie sense of apprehension. So again, you have this, um, not that they're seeing anything, but they're hearing stuff and they, they have this almost like sixth sense that something bad is out there. Uh, so I will continue here. In 1945, Pete Densham was participating in rescue work on the Cairngorm Mountains during World War II. One day he reported hearing strange noises, mist closing in on his location, and increasing pressure around his neck. He fled before seeing anything concrete. A friend of his, climber Richard Frere, wrote about his sense of a presence, utterly abstract but intensely real, on the mountain and heard an intensely high singing note a few years later in 1948. So this almost sounds like a Bigfoot howl, this almost siren-like call of, of Bigfoot or Yeti. Uh, Frere also presented an encounter of another mutual friend who wished to remain anonymous, while he camped on Ben Macdieu. He reported walking, waking up, feeling an inescapable feeling of dread, and looked out of his tent to see a large figure with dark hair standing in front of the moon in silhouette. So this is another sort of typical story we hear with, with these Bigfoot encounters. People will be in their tent, they hear footsteps, they hear something, they peek out, and they see a large hairy figure kind of staring at them. So very interesting. And, and again, a lot of the, the gray man stories have a supernatural sort of aura around them where it, it seems almost more spiritual. And again, the Yeti legends, the original ones seemed less corporeal and more spiritual. And the gray man of Ben Macdieu has a lot of that as well. So this story is interesting to me because it's more of this corporeal thing where, and we hear this a lot in just, you know, Bigfoot stories here in the new world where 
It's just this large hairy creature. Okay, so to continue, in 1958, naturalist and mountaineer Alexander Tunion published an article in the Scots Magazine about an encounter with the Gray Man in 1943. He says, I spent a 10-day leave climbing alone in the Cairngorms. One afternoon, just as I reached the summit cairn of Ben Macdu, mist swirled around Larig Gru and enveloped the mountain. The atmosphere became dark and oppressive. A fierce, bitter wind whisked among the boulders, and an odd sound echoed through the mist. A loud, foot, a loud footstep, it seemed. Then another, and another. A strange shape loomed up, receded, came charging at me. Without hesitation, I whipped out the revolver and fired three times at the figure. When it still came on, I turned and hared down the path, reaching Glendary in a time that I have never bettered. You may ask, was it really the fear leth mur? Frankly, I think it was. Again, we hear this uh, account of someone shooting at one of these things, and it seems corporeal. They can see it. It's got hair. It's making footsteps. So it seems physical, but then shooting at it seems to have no effect. Uh, so very interesting. And and again, him him running down back to, to Glenn Derry just reminds me of Kusang from the Abominable Snowman episode. That In that movie, he sees the Yeti and he runs down the hill and he just gets back to the monastery in like record time because he was just terrified. Um, so the, the last thing that this says here is no photographs of the big gray man have ever been taken. Photographer John A. Rennie supposedly found a series of footprints in Spay Valley measuring 19 inches long and 14 inches wide. These were published in a book, but he later discovered that they were a natural phenomenon caused by rainfall eroding the snow. And again, you hear a lot of that with the Yeti footprints, that it's um, melt, ice melt, and refreezing and melting and refreezing, and it distorts normal footprints. Who knows? Some of them seem very sharp, though, so it doesn't seem to be uh, snow melt. Uh, so some of the explanations that have been given, uh, illusions, hallucinations, or misinterpretation of natural stimulus brought on by exhaustion or isolation have been proposed by psychologists. Infrasound, which can be generated by wind, can cause feelings of uneasiness and anxiety and is possibly connected to paranormal sightings. So I mentioned all these things, uh, most of these things anyway, but the infrasound, um, hallucinations, misinterpretations. I talk about that all the time, misidentifications. So again, maybe a coalescence here of the wind and isolation and the altitude uh, is letting people sort of see things or think they see things. Um, another explanation, an optical illusion known as the broken specter is a plausible explanation for some visual elements of the big gray man legend. A Brocken specter, or mountain specter, can occur in certain atmospheric conditions when the sun is at a particular angle. The subject's shadow can be cast onto a cloud bank around them, creating the illusion of a large, shadowy humanoid figure. The poet James Hogg encountered a Brocken specter on Ben Mechdu as far back as 1791, describing a giant blackamoor at least 30 feet high and equally proportioned and very near me. I was actually struck powerless with astonishment and terror. Hogg's terror subsided when he observed the figure making the same gestures as his own, realizing that it was merely his own shadow when he removed his hat. British mountaineer Frank Smith stated that he observed his shadow cast as a Brock inspector across the mist on Ben Macdu as well. So you, you have these explanations, and the Brock inspector seems like a really good one for most of them. It doesn't explain auditory hallucinations or, or hearing footsteps mirroring your own. It doesn't explain th creatures moving when you're not moving. If you're in your tent and it's nighttime and you see a dark figure looking at you, uh, that can't be a Brock inspector. So some of this can be explained and some of it is a little harder to explain. So, um, but yeah, I just, uh, th this is a legend I had read about when I was very young, the big gray man of Ben Mokdu. And um, again, Outlander just... <laughs> All the all the town names and, and place names, like I said, Craig Nadun just made me think of this, and I thought this would be a cool episode to do, which is Bigfoot in the British Isles. So let us move on. Okay, so there's another very similar legend that comes from Wales. Uh, and this one, again, I, I apologize for the pronunciation. Uh, this one is Brennan Lud. Uh, in English, it's the Grey King or the Monarch of the, of the Mist. 
Uh, it's a legendary figure in Welsh, Welsh mythology. Recorded in mountainous locations throughout the country, the figure is always silent, semi-corporeal, is cloaked in mist or a gray cloak, and preys on unwary travelers, especially children. So again, you have this, you know, tall, human-like figure. Uh, it's in the mist. It's gray. Um, so it's just very much like the gray man of Ben Macdew, the gray king moniker of the mist i mean mist seems to play a big part of this but you're talking you're also talking about up on the mountaintops so um i will go through a little bit of the description here uh although brendan lude is a solitary individual figure and is not part of any other mythological groups or species consistent accounts of the brendan lude are found across wales with only minimal variations an archetypal description of the figure and its localities was given by folklorist Marie Trevelyan in 1909. Stories about the Brennan Lude, the great king or monarch of the mist, were told in the most mountainous districts. In the north, he was described as being very mighty and powerful. He was represented as sitting among the mountains, robed in gray clouds and mist, and woe to anybody who was caught in his clutches. Snowden and the ranges of it, Kader Idris, Plin Plinimon, and other lofty places were his favorite haunts. In the south, he was regarded as hungering for victims and children were warned not to venture too high up in the mountains, lest the Brennan Lewid should seize them. So hungering for victims, this sounds a little bit like a Wendigo. So it, it's just very interesting how a lot of these legends uh, overlap, and you hear a lot of the same uh, tropes and characteristics. Uh, you know, it doesn't look like a Wendigo, but the hungering for victims, uh, that reminded me of a Wendigo. But gray and then mist again this sounds a little bit more folklorish than corporeal uh ben mcdew is a little bit kind of 50 50 this sounds a little bit more on the spiritual paranormal side if you will in the same text travelian records another encounter in a different locality much further south this figure is also named brennan Lewid, and the description closely matches that of the figure in the north an old woman said that many a time she shuddered when they ascended to the mineral wells on the Smilog and was glad to come down because the people and children warned everyone not to linger late, for the Brennan Lude would be after them. She further told them that there was no trusting him, for sometimes on the brightest summer evening he would come suddenly and draw them into his clutches. Trevelyan gives a third account of the figure in Carmathenshire. Carmathenshire which has certain embellishments not recorded at other locations. This version is notable for associations with the court of a king, which he names as the court of the mist, and hunting hounds named as the dogs of the sky. These aspects suggest a connection in the area between the Brennan Lewid and the Welsh version of the Celtic otherworld, Anrin and the uh, Sin Anrin. Again, I'm mispronouncing these. I'm going to link to all of these articles in the description below so you guys can read these for yourselves and uh, see what I'm mispronouncing here. <laughs> uh, so comparison with other legends, while the Brennan Lewid is a singular entity, the tales of it have been compared with other features of Welsh, Celtic, and European mythology. In Wales, the king of the Twilith Teg, Gwyn Ap Nud, is said to haunt mountaintops and is also associated with the Gwyn Enwyn, uh, I keep butchering these, I'm sorry. Similarly, its association with Kader Idris may be connected with Idris the Giant, who is said to be king of the mountain. Other comparisons have been made with the Hearn the Hunter legend and the pan-European motif of the wild hunt. So giants living up in the mountains, these, these giant people. Uh, we hear this a lot in Native American lore here in the Americas. So again, you have this overlap of... Uh, giant creatures giant men who live in the woods and some of them will kidnap you and, and eat or eat you and others are protectors uh so just interesting to me that you have this sort of uh, overlap between cultures so are these things real and just every culture on earth is coming into contact with them or is this some sort of shared you know subconscious a genetic memory that we're all sharing just food for thought uh but to tie it in one of the most notable modern comparisons is with the amphir the 
uh, the big gray man, a similarly ghostly figure associated with the mists of Ben Macdia in the Cairngorms mountain range of Scotland. So, like I said, very similar and not surprising. I mean, these, it's the British Isles. They're all, uh, very close together. They're, they're all interconnected, uh, a lot of sharing of culture. So a lot of sharing of stories. So this one does seem to me a little bit more on the spiritual side, the more mythological side, uh, the gods of the mountains, you know, the gods of the mist. So is it Bigfoot? Is it a hairy humanoid? Is it a ghost? Is it simply a legend? That's for you guys to decide. So let us move on to Ireland. So Ireland has lots of legends. I mean, there's, there's the Banshee, there's Leprechauns, uh, but they also have a hairy humanoid, a sort of Bigfoot variant called the Grugach. Uh, so I will read from this article. And again, all these articles will be in the description below. According to Nick Redfern's The Bigfoot Book, the Encyclopedia of Sasquatch, Yeti, and Cryptid Primates, which I think I've reviewed on my blog, I'll link to that as well. There is an Irish word, Grugach, which can mean magician, giant, or ogre, but actually means the hairy one. Very interesting. Within various medieval literature, detailing history and folklore throughout Europe, one who looks hard enough won't have to struggle to find references to hairy, man-like beasts, variously referred to as orcs, ogres, trolls, wood woeses, and wild men, in various documents from England and its surrounding countries. Nick Redfern proposed that the Grugach of Irish lore is a Bigfoot or similar wild man. So let's look at the description here and some sightings, and you guys can decide what this might be. Uh, the Grugach, also known as the Grogach, Gelt, or on occasion the Puka, or sometimes even Tipperary Ossery Wolfman, is a large bipedal ape-like creature that allegedly lives in Ireland. The creature appears in mythology around Ireland and is sighted only on rare occasions, but over the years has been seen all over Northern Ireland and on occasion South Ireland. Despite this, it gets very little attention as Ireland is a small place and even though the majority of its countryside, most people say there is not enough thick forest and food to support and hide a large ape, despite the fact it supports deer in some places and once even supported large megafauna. It has been estimated that the amount of forest covering Ireland is as little as mere 1%, with County Wicklow, home to at least one known alleged Grugach sighting, having the most forest, and County Meath, not known to have any sightings, having the least. The creature is very similar to other Bigfoot-like creatures, the most well-known example being the North American Sasquatch, though unlike Sasquatch, most sightings of the Grugach, as well as the Woodwows, describe it to be more human-like. It is normally depicted with a small, wide, high-up nose, sometimes described as piggish, a mostly flat face, a protruding brow ridge, and strangely, with no sagittal crest. A sagittal crest being a crest on the skull of certain apes, such as gorilla, which gives their head a cone shape, described by most alleged Bigfoot witnesses, though occasionally the crest is there. It is more similar to the Minnesota Iceman than the traditional Bigfoot description. It is often compared to a Neanderthal, as the facial features appear similar, However, Neanderthals are believed to have only stood at four foot tall on average, fully grown. Sightings of the creature are all around Ireland, though mostly are centered around Silv Sliviarnara. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, and Ballyboli. So, yeah, we have, uh, again, a, a Bigfoot creature that is slightly different. And Scott and I talked about this on our show, that some of them, you know, some people when they see Bigfoot, or a Bigfoot-like creature, they'll say it, it was definitely gorilla-like. It was ape-like. It was an animal. It looked like a primate. Uh, other accounts will say it was a man. It was a hairy man. Like, this was a human being, but not a human being. But it was not a gorilla. It was not an animal. It was an intelligent um, primate, more like a human. A lot of hunters have said they've got these things in their sights, and they couldn't shoot it because it looked like a person. It looked like a, a man. A human being it didn't look like an animal so um that's interesting to me that these uh seem a little bit more uh human-like so i will talk about some sightings here in january of 2016 a mother and irish bigfoot researcher maxine caulfield was walking her dogs in slavianora forest a place believed by some to be haunted when her dog started acting strangely which had happened on other occasions during her research 
It was not until she got home and posted her pictures from her forest online that people noticed the strange figure in it, which her and some others who saw the picture online compared to the Gruga, which Maxine was looking for at the time. Ghost stories about Sliverana have been told since October 1942, when a U.S. Air Force B-17 Flying Fortress bomber crashed into a mountain in the area, killing eight of the ten people in the plane. The photo appears similar to a ghillie suit, and uh, the, the photos here, I'll put it up on the screen, though its arm appears to be a branch, which could be explained by the creature holding the branch while, with its hand while covered by its fur, or the sleeve of the suit, or walking past a branch when the photo is taken. However, despite the photo likely being a hoax slash misidentification, another alleged sighting in the area adds some credence to it. Around half past four in the evening on the 14th of July, 2017, a wildlife photographer and her husband went out to Slevonora Forest, Northern Ireland. She says it was raining very heavily and they were walking their unusual route when they heard, I'm sorry, they were walking their usual route when they heard a strange howling noise. They hadn't went far into the forest when her German shepherd started barking at the noise. At that point, the howl sounded quite close, but they couldn't find the source of the noise. A few seconds later, the noise stopped, then started again. This happened four times. She says she had heard the noise before in the same area of the forest, but she was alone with the dogs, so she doubted herself a bit. So we're hearing, again, howls. Um, and she's got this photo, and again, I'll put it up on the screen. Uh, don't know what to make of this. It's, you know, a typical blob squatch. It looks like something, but it could be anything. Uh, so to continue with the sightings, uh, she told researcher Deborah Hatswell she intended on going back there without the dogs to see if she'd still hear it. She reported to the same researcher that on the 17th of July, 2017, she returned to the area with her phone, but she didn't hear anything. She brought her partner's smaller dog, Barney, with her, and he stopped randomly near where she says she found a double X made from large tree trunks. It is worth noting that in other parts of the world, field researchers also report this in alleged Bigfoot habitats. So tree structures and Xs, and I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I'm hoping to get Scott on the show. We're going to talk about some Bigfoot stuff that is a little sketchy, and that's that's one of the topics I do want to talk to him about. But um, that's a story for another time. Uh, the dog just stood there sniffing the wind with his ears up and one paw off the ground as if he had smelt something. Later on, her partner and her both got the feeling of being watched after the dog started doing the same thing again. She also says that, while it may be unrelated, she lost the dog's ball in the area and looked for a long time without finding it, before going back the next day and finding it laying in the middle of the trail. She says she will go back again until she finds something to prove her story. However, no more information is given and nothing else has been reported in that forest, though there are two nearby forests where things have been reported, Dunluis and Ballyboli. In Tipperary, Ireland, it's a long way to Tipperary, uh, there are historical stories of wolfman warriors, and in Ossery, there are also historical accounts of wolfmen, which may be the source of the howling. However, all modern sightings of hairy humanoids describe ape-like creatures, which can also make howling noises, except for a select few in the south of Ireland, in the Republic. In 1997, two men claimed they were in the allegedly haunted Ballyboli forest when they heard what they called a loud flapping sound. So that, that almost sounds like Jersey Devil to me. <laughs> so very interesting. They thought nothing of it and continued walking until they heard a stranger noise, such as a woman moaning in pain. That's interesting because a lot of Bigfoot howls and reports say it sound, they think at first it's like a, a woman screaming or a child crying. So very interesting. They were horrified. They... <sighs> So a lot of this is written poorly, so I'm, I'm sorry. They were horrified to find a group of trees thickly smeared with blood. As they ran off, one of the men claims he saw four dark humanoid figures standing behind them, but not chasing them. Where only a few seconds earlier, nothing had been there. Other reports from the area describe druid rituals where animals are burned to death and campfires and teepee-shaped tree structures can be found in the forest, though the tree structures are more common. A year later, a 63-year-old woman who was working as a pet sitter and her husband were walking some local dogs in Ballyboli. They approached a small patch of dead trees one day, and they claim they saw what they thought was a human crouched down in the bushes. Agitating the dogs, the creature raised its head, showing it was not human. The woman says her husband approached the creature, who growled at him when he came too close. She told him to step back. He thought it was an escaped chimpanzee at the time, until he got within 15 feet of it, 
and the tall figure stood up on its hind legs. So again, you hear like, he's thinking this is a monkey, not a person. He He's saying, oh, maybe it's a chimpanzee. So more ape-like. Um, they noticed the large creature was carrying a large stick. The creature smashed its stick against the tree, then ran off at high speed. The whole thing lasted all of four minutes. She described the creature as having a chimpanzee-like face, but with a broader nose. It was covered in dark brown, black fur, and was eight feet tall. Later that year, a man claimed to have seen an ape-like creature using improvised eating utensils. Interesting. The report came one week after a man claimed to have seen a similar creature in Suffolk, England. There are many Facebook pages about the Grugach, such as the IBRO, Irish Bigfoot Research Organization, and the IWRO, Irish Wildman Research Organization. Despite most sightings being in the north, both of these groups are based in South Ireland. One, however, is based near Ballybully Forest and frequently visits the forest to search for evidence of the Grugach. So we, we have the, these groups looking for these creatures, and the there is the concern that Ireland is not densely wooded, like you'd, like for, you'd say, like the Pacific Northwest or the Adirondack Mountains, where you have large stretches of land where there's no civilization, there's no people, and it's just pure wilderness. It's trees, it's streams, uh, there's bear, there's deer, there's all sorts of animals. And while there's deer here, it, it does make a case for saying, there's not a lot of cover for these creatures. So why are they being seen? Does that mean they don't exist? No, but as I mentioned earlier, is this a, a sort of shared cultural memory, a genetic memory? Uh, or, you know, why do people see these creatures? Um, it's very possible that these things do exist over there. Uh, a lot of the uh, similarities, the howls, the, the footprints, the, the feelings are, are, are there, but just wanted to mention that because Ireland is very small and there isn't a lot of deep, dense woods, but maybe there is something lurking there. So let me know what you guys think. Okay, so I've just shared three legends of these sort of Yeti-like creatures, one from Scotland, the Grey Man of Ben Macdew, uh, one from Wales, one from Ireland. Um, and they, they all seem to be a little bit more on the mythological side. There's very supernatural stuff surrounding them. They appear to be in a mist or you're only hearing footsteps or howls. There's not a lot of visual sightings, but I found a bunch of sightings from the British Isles and these jump all over. These are England, Scotland, everywhere. So there's, there's no particular order here, but I'm going to read some of these. They're very short, uh, but it will give you a sense that people are seeing these types of creatures across the pond. Uh, so this first one is from Abernethy Forest, Strathspey, Scotland. In 2012, a former primate keeper and his brother witnessed a seven-foot-tall ape man eating blackberries in Abernethy Forest. He described the creature as looking like an old bonobo chimp with a flat muzzle and an upright gorilla's body. Uh, so to me, this one has some credibility. He's a primate keeper. This is this is somebody who's used to being around primates and gorillas and monkeys. And they see this creature in the woods, uh, seven foot tall, an ape man eating berries, uh, looking like a chimp with a flat muzzle and an upright gorilla's body. So very, very descriptive here. You can, you can kind of imagine what they saw and it's eating berries. Uh, so again, you'd think that someone who worked closely with primates would know the difference between an ape man and any other creature, or a bear or a deer or, you know, a man in a ghillie suit, whatever, whatever you, you know, explanation you want to throw out there. Um, so that story just was, was very interesting to me just because of who the witness is. So this one is from Colchester in Suffolk, England. In June 2012, a couple were walking along a quiet road in the early afternoon when they saw a big hairy man in the woods, which they described as being between six and a half and seven feet tall. The being was covered in hair through which strong musculature could be seen. It had longer hair on its head and upper body. That's another trait we hear a lot is that these creatures are covered in hair, but sometimes the hair on their head is longer. So that's interesting to me. Um, but again, we're hearing 
the, a creature topping out at around seven feet tall, which is, is tall, but in, in North America here, we hear a lot more of like the eight, nine foot range. And here we're hearing six and a half, seven foot tall range. So I, I just thought that was worth pointing out. So this one from Box Hill in Surrey, the British Bigfoot or Wodawos, which we talked about in the Ireland section. And there's a drawing of it. So very man-like holding a stick. Uh, late one evening in the summer of 2012, a jogger heard wood knocks and saw some sort of large muscular ape standing on two legs and over six feet tall, covered in brown fur with gray patches. Its face was very human looking with a flat nose and the jaw was big and out of proportion to the head, which was domed at the top. After 30 seconds, it left and she could smell a stale farm animal smell that lingered. So a few interesting things here. You have the wood knocks, which again, I'm very iffy on wood knocks. Uh, but over six feet tall. So again, not on that huge range of eight or nine feet, you know, a little over six or maybe six and a half, maybe seven, uh, very human looking face, which is a theme here in the British Isles that these things look a little bit more human, uh, but are still clearly primates, uh, a, a large jaw out of proportion to the head. So that sounds primitive. And uh, the smell, which, again, we hear a lot in North American Bigfoot sightings, especially in the South, the swamp monsters and the skunk apes, they have that smell. Um, and it's described as an, an like wet dog that rolled in garbage. So just, just really, really stinky. So I, I just thought that was interesting as well. So this one comes from Tunbridge Wells Common in Kent. And here we have a slightly taller one, an eight foot tall bipedal ape man covered in hair with red demonic eyes is said to have been seen several times over the past 70 years on Tunbridge Wells Common, a 200 acre wooded site which sits in the center of town. The most recent sighting is believed to have taken place in October 2012 when a dog walker came face to face with the creature which roared at him and made off into the woods. So here you have a slightly different creature. It's it's taller. It's got red eyes, which we hear this a lot. The, the, the glowing eyes, whether it's eye shine or an actual glow, hard to say. Uh, it, it, a wooded area that sits in the center of town. So that, that to me is interesting, but it's a recent sighting. It's, this is not something that was like from 300 years ago that could be chalked up to, you know, tall tales or yellow journalism or anything like that. So I thought that one was pretty cool. Uh, and this one comes to us from Sherwood Forest in Nottingham. So all you Robin Hood fans out there. In 2013, a man was driving along the Worksop Road at about 4.50 p.m. when he saw two figures standing with just within the trees. He described the big one as being male, about six and a half feet tall, with a weird-shaped head like a chimp and a human-like face. The other figure was about three feet tall, but looked the same as the big one, having a chimp-like head with a human face on it. They were both covered in brown hair. Um, so once again, we have a shorter uh, adult, six and a half feet tall, uh, clearly some sort of ape man. It, it's got chimp-like features, but the face is human. Uh, and this appears to have been with a juvenile, uh, three foot tall, but looked just like the bigger one. So very strange. So the next story comes to us from Lee Woods Nature Reserve in Bristol. Uh, this one happened on August 17th, 2013. A Bristol resident witnessed an ape-like creature digging in the earth with a twig. It appeared to pick something up and began eating it before using another twig to pick its teeth. The strange behavior continued, with the witness claiming that it wove some twigs together, stood up, snapped a large tree branch, leaned it against another tree, and walked off. Uh, it was about, it doesn't say here, the, 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 the number is missing. It was about something feet tall old looking with gray skin. The witness described it as having human features on an ape-like head. So here we go again, the ape-like features, but with a human face. And it seems to be using tools. It's using a twig to dig something out of the, the ground. Uh, so very interesting that this guy seeing uh, the creature digging in the earth and then picking its teeth. It seems like, you know, early human behavior. So this next one comes from Gentle Shaw near Burntwood, Canuck. Around 2 a.m. one day in June of 2013, three friends parked down a lane claimed they saw a human-shaped creature crouching on the ground nearby. 
it suddenly stood straight up to a height of seven to eight feet and ran towards them, rustling bushes and shaking big trees. The friends sped away and could see it keeping up with them in the trees. So here's another sort of trope we hear with Bigfoot sightings all over that somebody sees something, they think it's a bear, they think it's a tree stump, uh, they, they think it's something else, and then it stands up. And that's really what catches their attention. You know, they're seeing something, oh, look, there's a bear over there. There's, you know, weird looking tree stump. It looks like it's moving. And then it stands up on two feet and walks away. And this one is in the bigger range, seven to eight feet tall, ran towards them. So this, this sounds a little bit more aggressive than the typical Bigfoot sightings we hear where they generally run off or they just stand and stare at you before slowly moving off. Uh, so, so a little strange there. So this next story is from Lascar Wood um, near Sherwood Forest, which there was already one sighting from. In 2014, at around 11.15 p.m., a man was driving home after a day's of fishing. Passing Woodland, he saw a huge hair-covered figure standing on two legs. He slammed on the brakes and reversed to get a closer look at the creature, but it had gone. So we hear that a lot, that someone will see something, roadside crossing or just something in the woods, and they run off. You know, we don't generally hear about them running at you. So I thought that was pretty cool. So this next one is pretty cool. And I only really know about this from watching Outlander because they talk about this a lot in the show. So this is from the, the Culloden battlefield near Inverness. So a lot of the show happens in Inverness and they talk about the Culloden battle and uh, the battle of Culloden. I don't know much about it, but in, in layman's terms, it's real. it's, it's the battle where the, the Scottish Highlanders fought the British troops and were slaughtered uh the british troops had you know muskets and cannons and the highlanders had swords and shields so uh and the culloden battlefield was like basically a swamp so really rough terrain and the british were just better equipped uh more technologically advanced in their weaponry and just wiped out uh the scots they won the battle i think it only lasted about an hour, the entire battle. Um, and after that, the Brits kind of went in and, and wiped out the Highland culture. So a very big battle for them. Uh, and it changed the the course of Scottish history. So this is a short story, but it takes place on the Culloden battlefield. So I just wanted to tie all that in together. In 2015, a woman claimed that she saw a hair-covered humanish figure about seven to eight feet tall, walk across the cairns toward the direction of the battlefield. So again, we're talking a larger creature than is typical, seven to eight feet tall, hair covered, humanoid figure, um, walking towards the battlefield. And this one also just reminded me of an episode I did, um, and I'll put a link to that below as well, of uh, Bigfoot sightings near Gettysburg, which was a huge battle here in the United States and a very pivotal battle, almost like uh, the Battle of Culloden was. So tie that all together. So in Haslingdon, Lancashire, in 2015, a 17-year-old girl witnessed a large, mousy, blonde-colored creature standing in her kitchen doorway that looked like Chewbacca from Star Wars. She was on the phone at the time and said the creature poked his head and upper body around the doorway like he was checking on who was on the phone. They made eye contact for five seconds, after which the creature left. So I, I, I wish there were some more follow-up to these stories, but uh, it, it's been hard finding stories from the British Isles. I have to dig a little bit deeper, but I got really excited about this episode this week and just kind of dove in here. So this is more of a, a broad overview, but another cool story, uh, mousy blonde colored. And again, we don't really hear that. You often hear brown or black, sometimes like a reddish brown, but every now and then you do hear about uh, gray or white or blonde Bigfoot-like creatures. So interesting that she saw a blonde-colored one, and she's saying it looked like Chewbacca. And I mean, you look at Chewbacca, and that's, you know, like Bigfoot. It's just this large, hairy man with a sort of monkey-like face. So interesting that it just peeked in. You know, again, we hear a lot of stories about these things being curious, and they will just look in windows or look in doorways, and they're just trying to see what's going on. So pretty cool. Next story from Middlewoods, often in Suffolk. In August 2015, a man walking in Woodland suddenly became overwhelmed by a fear that he wasn't alone. On leaving the area, he heard a monkey go, woo woo, and an almighty crashing noise. Suddenly, a two-legged thing, like a chimp in color, but a gorilla in build, 
approximately five foot seven inches in height, came hurtling across the trail, using its long arms to knock aside the trees. He noted that its arms were at least a third longer than his own. So he's saying it was chimp-like in color, so a probably like a dark black, uh, but a gorilla in build, so it looked like a gorilla. Chimp-like in color, under six feet tall, his estimation. And again, witness accounts can be wrong. People will overestimate, they'll underestimate. It's a fleeting glimpse, you know, and you're scared and details can escape you, you know, or be wrong. So, uh, but we hear this a lot, this sort of preternatural sixth sense that before people see something, they get this feeling. They get a feeling of dread. They get a feeling they're being watched. Uh, the woods will go quiet of, you know, bird chatter and, and squirrels and all the little creatures that run around. It'll get quiet before people see something. So I thought it was interesting that he just became overwhelmed by a fear before he actually saw this creature. And we go back to Scotland. This is from Loch Awe. In March 2016, around 1 a.m., a woman driving home along the road that runs along Loch Awe saw a deer running across the road, followed by two large, tall, hairy man-like creatures. She said that one was eight feet tall and was accompanied by a similar creature that was two feet smaller, so around six feet tall. Chillingly, their eyes glowed in the light of her car. So the eye shine, and I've talked about stories like this on my show before about a, a Bigfoot-like creature chasing deer or chasing a deer, and there's just tons of Bigfoot stories out there like that that Again, people don't see the Bigfoot first. They see a deer kind of run out of the woods like it's scared of something, and then the creature kind of follows it. That's when they're seeing the Bigfoot. They're not just seeing Bigfoot. They're seeing a deer or multiple deer running away, and then they see the creature. So that one stood out to me too because that just has a very sort of North American Bigfoot Sasquatch feel to it. Next story, Ellesmere Worsley. On the 16th of July, 2016, a group of friends witnessed a seven-foot-tall hairy man with an odd-shaped head on the golf course of Ellesmere Golf Club. It was hunched over like it was old or injured and was making chattering sounds like an ape, swaying from side to side as if agitated, clapping its huge hands loudly. The group then heard a loud wailing coming from another part of the trees, and the creature turned and ran away. So the howling, we're hearing this, uh, hunched over like it was injured. Th these are weird things, and... and my, my my sense here is that it's a hoax. It's on a golf course. So was this a man in a suit trying to hoax? But again, you think a hoaxer would be running and trying to scare people with the arms flailing. It's not going to pretend that it was injured or old. Uh, clapping its hands, chattering like an ape. These things sound interesting to me. So if you do believe that it's an animal and it was injured or sick, or old and just confused, maybe it did wander onto a golf course, and then you hear this other howl like, hey, get back here, people are going to see you, you moron. <laughs> so maybe that's what it was, but who knows? Again, there's not a lot of follow-up for these stories, but uh, and a lot of these happened like in the mid-2015, 2016, 2013. So they're all from the same time period, uh, which is you know unfortunate. I wish there was a better cross-section here, but maybe in a future episode. So this one comes to us from Coleman's Caravan Park in Hassocks, Brighton. So this is like an RV park. In May 2017, a married couple on a seaside holiday awoke to see a hairy thing with its face pressed up against the glass of the caravan window. The man sat up and lit his lighter and for a few seconds got a clear look at the creature. He said it had a full beard with thin hair on top of its head and was showing its teeth, which were like dog's teeth. The creature ran off. So as I mentioned a few stories ago, these creatures seem to sometimes be very curious. They will peek in windows, they will peek in doorways, they'll try doorknobs, and this just sounds like that sort of story that this thing wandered in and was like, who's in there? What is this thing? And our last story of the episode comes from Medway in Kent. On January 21st, 2019, at 8.30 a.m., a woman was out in, on her horse paddock when she became aware of somebody walking along the other side of the fence and bush line, roughly 150 yards away. It struck her as odd that no one can get there easily, as there is a 30-foot drop to a freight rail line below. As she turned to look at the figure, it ducked down behind a large bush. She realized that the figure was extremely large, as its head and shoulders towered above the bush, 
which is over six feet tall. What also struck her was that although she only saw it take a few steps, the stride pattern was very wide. So a uh, hard to get place, hard to get to place. She's out in the horse paddock and this thing crouches behind a bush and it's still not really hidden. So it makes you wonder about how intelligent these creatures are. Uh, it's almost like a human being trying to hide behind a, you know, a little pole, you know, out in the street or whatever, like clearly going to be seen. Little kids do that, but maybe these creatures have the intelligence of a little child. So there you go. There are some, some Bigfoot stories from across the pond over in the British Isles, uh, Scotland and England and Ireland and Wales. And again, the first few to me seem a little bit more like folklore and mythology, gods of the mountains, you know, creatures in the mist, uh, just old wives' tales, things to scare people, things that people hallucinate while they're up there. But I always tend to believe that any legend, any myth, any of these stories has some sort of grain of truth to them. They come from somewhere. Somebody saw something at some point. So where did they come from? Love to hear you guys' comments. So let me know what you think. Uh, did you know that Bigfoot was seen outside of the North American continent? Uh, did you know they were seen in Great Britain? So the British Isles, Bigfoot on the British Isles. It's not something we normally associate with the British Isles, but apparently people are seeing these creatures and very similar in appearance, very similar in behavior. And, the, you know, tree knockings, howls, uh, the color of the creatures. Again, over there, they seem a little bit more human-like in the face overall from what we've read here. But um, if you guys would like to hear more about this, let me know in the comments below. If you have a story or want to suggest a story or you want to come on the show, let me know, jason at auditontold.com. Keep you confidential if you want, or you can come on the show, or you can just write out your story, and I will gladly read it on the air for you and keep you anonymous if you so choose. Uh, check out our merch store. We have hoodies and t-shirts and all sorts of cool stuff there if you want some odd and untold gear. And uh, until next time, everybody, question everything, just like I question all these stories. It doesn't mean I don't believe. It's just we have to question everything. We can't just blindly accept that people saw what they think they saw, not to say that they're lying, but we need to question it. That's how knowledge is gained. So next week, everybody.